Y'all, it took me so long to do my makeup today. It took me so long to do my makeup today, partially because I'm very easily distracted. But this time it was valid because why was there a freaking little fly terrorizing me today? <gasps> He's back. So I was in there minding my business, doing my makeup. And I hear a little bzz, 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 bzz. I'm like, what the hell is that? Get away from me. It's a little flat. And I swat it away, right? And he leaves for a little bit and I continue on in my little process. Then he comes back. This time he tries to land on my face. So I swat him away again. Get away from me. He goes away for a little bit. Then he comes back. Now I'm mad. Now I'm irritated because I like, I got shit to do. You're getting in my way and I don't let you live twice. I just did a little win, 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 win. Now I have to murder him. So I go and I try to find my fly swatter. Can't find my fly swatter. Don't know where the hell that thing is. So then I grab a freaking towel and I, you know, roll it up and I swat at him. And then I think my job here is done. I've done what I need to do. And I go, I sit down and I do my makeup again. Would you believe, would you believe this little nigga came back? He came back. Okay, I don't know about you, but if somebody tries to kill me three times, if somebody shoes me away three times, I'm not coming back. He don't know when he's not wanted. He can't figure it out and I need him to. So finally, I just I decided he won. He wins, he wins, okay? He can exist because I have shit to do. So anyway, I tell you all that to, to let you know that if you see me going like this or you see me randomly get distracted, it's because my mortal enemy is in here fl flying around without a care in the world. Like I'm not wishing death upon him and his descendants. Anyways. What up, Hope Biscuits? It's your girl's kitten. Back at it again. Today, we are here to watch some overly sarcastic productions. We're back with my girl, Red. We're here for some miscellaneous myths. This one is called Loki Nearly Kills Everybody Again. I'm super excited about it. You guys already know I'm real into mythology and I'm real into how Red breaks down the subject matter and like gives us just like really clear exposition about what's going on. I'm just a really big fan of it. Hope you guys are doing well, staying safe and sanitized. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Here's a fun existential question to ponder at 11 a.m. on a Friday. How do you kill a god? At first, ask Sam and Dean. Sam and Dean know how to kill a god. I think, I haven't made it there, but I think they do try to kill like regular god, right? but then they have also killed like other gods. Anyway, Sam and Dean know. It's not an existential crisis it, or it's not an existential question, Red. It's a question for hunters. God. At first glance, this might sound like an impossible thought experiment. Mm -hmm. Gods and immortality conceptually go hand in hand most of the time. Right. Modern fantasy or urban fantasy stories will often world build a paradigm where gods are utterly unkillable so long as they are believed in and experience right. a slow diminishment into non-existence as their worship dries up. Mm -hmm. But that's very overcomplicated compared to the source material. Mythological gods die all the time all around the world. Right. The problem is it just doesn't usually stick. A god who gets shot with mistletoe or ripped into pieces or dies in childbirth usually just gets some prophecy of resurrection or posts mm -hmm. up in the local underworld and becomes a god of death. Right. It's not like they stop being a god just because somebody murdered them. This does vary, and it's an easy mistake to lump together all mythologies into the same overarching paradigm as if they have anything in common beyond having at some point in history been a living religion somewhere in the world. In right. some pantheons, age and death seem pretty alien to the gods. The Greek gods don't really worry about either most of the time, and even getting ripped to pieces or eaten is just a minor inconvenience <laughs> equated to imprisonment. Right. Contrastingly, the Egyptian gods do have myths where they die, but mm -hmm. very few where they stay dead. Most interestingly, they even have stories about gods getting old, usually Ra becoming aged and unfit for the throne to justify why the current pharaoh's favorite furry deserves a turn on the sunboat. Oh, but if no. there's one pantheon of gods that's widely known to be more killable than most, it's the Norse. Now, the Norse pantheon is also distinguished by the fact that pretty much every text we have about it was written after the Norse religion had been replaced mm -hmm. by Christianity, and the Norse gods were no longer being actively worshipped. One of the most prominent sources for Norse mythology, and the source for today's myth, was Snorri Sturluson's Prose Edda, written in Iceland in the early 1200s BCE with a very intentional twist of nerfing the Norse gods. The I was gonna ask like how that 
affects the stories being told, right? Because like, obviously with like Greek Roman mythology, Egyptian mythology, we have basically not like firsthand accounts. <laughs> I was, was going to say firsthand accounts of the gods, but you guys know what I mean. Like we have the OG source material, but you know, for some religions, all we have is the retelling, you know, and every retelling is going to be biased on the part of the person who's doing the telling. You you feel me? Like, you get me? Anyway, yeah. So I was gonna ask how that affects it, but that makes sense. It, he's going to intentionally make it seem like the Norse gods are not as good as the almighty God, right? That's that's his whole, that's his whole, um, not shtick, purpose. There's a word I'm looking for. I can't think of words right now, it's fine. The prologue puts a lot of effort into coming up with an intricate explanation for how the supposed Norse gods were all actually great lords and ladies from Trojan War oh. Troy, who the superstitious people of Western Europe foolishly took for gods, telling tall tales of mythologized exploits of these very normal human beings. Pope tested, Jesus approved. Got Thankfully, it. this is not a bit that Snorri commits to when it comes to the actual retelling of the myths in question, mm -hmm. which are pretty clear on the gods being gods, but it does mean that almost every story we have from the Norse pantheon was being documented with the benefit of hindsight, and in many cases, an explicit effort on the part of the writer to humanize the gods. Right. And, it isn't and because of that, obviously, there's going to be aspects of the story that are changed or twisted or turned from a negative to a positive. So that's always really interesting to see how the stories, or I guess to imagine how the stories have probably been changed. And it is interesting that one of the most famous myths in Norse mythology is how the gods all know that they are destined to perish horribly in the inescapable fires of Ragnarok, the mm -hmm. twilight of the gods. So evidence suggests that even before Christianization, the Norse gods were definitely not immortal. In right. fact, as we'll learn today, it turns out they're not even naturally ageless. So mm -hmm. today, let's talk about the time Loki nearly ruined everything. <laughs> no, not that time. Not the big one either. <laughs> nearly is the operative word. Right, twilight okay. is still a long ways off. It's only the tea time of the gods. Oh, okay, Our story thanks. begins with Odin, Loki, and a dubiously relevant other guy trekking through the wilderness. In the interest of not starving to death, they snag a random ox and murder it into a healthy snack by way of an improvised oven. But when they so the gods can even starve to death? Okay, interesting. But when they check on the cooking progress, the meat is stubbornly unaffected by the flames. Mm. After confirming that it isn't a one-time thermodynamic fluke, it becomes clear that something is magically preventing their dinner from cooking. And that something turns out to be an eagle posted up on a nearby tree. It demands a share of the meat before it'll let them roast it to perfection. I'm the godly dead. trio agree and quickly regret it when the eagle grabs all the best parts of the cow and horfs them down post-haste. Mm. Loki, in particular, is extra mad and whacks the ermit raptor with a stick, which would probably work wonders on any ordinary bird, but goes very badly with this magic one because the stick gets stuck and the eagle flies off, dragging oh, Loki behind it and steering him face first into every appealingly sharp rock or tree along the way. Mm. When Loki's bravado has been sufficiently rock smacked out of him, the eagle quietly gives him the terms of his release. It'll stop knocking him around, but only on the condition that on a day of the eagle's choosing, Loki will lure the goddess Idun out of the safe confines of Asgard, along with her magical apples that are responsible for the Aesir's eternal youth. Don't do that shit. Don't, uh uh. Absolutely not. You better keep getting smacked around and figure out how to escape. And Loki agrees. Of the course eagle he releases does. him and flies away, and the trio wrap up their journey and return home. And when the appointed day rolls around, Loki lures Ethan out of Asgard with the claim that he's found apples growing in the wild that look just like her magic ones. It's the darndest thing. I guess they really do grow on trees. <laughs> Okay, Loki. Since she should definitely bring them all with her to check. Mm -hmm. While she investigates, mm -hmm. the eagle swoops down and abducts her. Although by now, Loki has realized its true identity. The eagle is nothing but a magical transformation taken on by the powerful Jotun Thiazzi. Without Ethan or her apples, the Aesir's immortality turns out to be highly conditional, and mm -hmm. they all start aging rather alarmingly. The Aesir right. convene a meeting to try and figure out what the hell is happening and where Ethan has vanished off to, and they quickly put together that the last time anyone saw her, she was leaving Asgard with Loki. Well, all right, Loki. Do it. Loki is dragged before the party Parliament of Gods and threatened with an assortment of creatively horrible fates until he's sufficiently terrified to agree to save the world again. He borrows Freya's feather cloak, takes the form of a falcon, and flies over to Jotunheim for the rematch of the century that he desperately does not want to do. <laughs> Lucky for Loki, Thiazzi isn't home, and Ethan is relatively unguarded, so he hastily transforms her and the precious apples of youth into a travel-sized nut and flies away as hard as he can. Oh, Regrettably, smart. it's still not fast enough, as when Thiazzi comes home from a hard day's fishing and finds his favorite hostage missing in action, he does what everybody in the Norse myths do and figures Loki did it. Because it's always Loki's fault. If something has gone wrong, it's always Loki's fault. And it's not even like Loki is a scapegoat because he really does be fucking shit up. 
He goes back into eagle mode and tears off after Loki, kicking up a huge storm in his wake. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile in Asgard, the geriatric deities see, or more realistically hear, Loki panicking on the horizon and set about figuring out how to save him from his terrifying pursuer. What they I feel like they could have set up a plan before they just sent Loki off though. L like, I just, what was the communication here? Did Loki let them know like, hey, it's this dude, so maybe we should figure something out? Or did they literally just tell Loki, fix this shit? And then afterwards go, oh, well, maybe if we want him to fix it, we should set him up for success. I'm just wondering, I'm just curious. Here, Loki panicking on the horizon and set about figuring out how to save him from his terrifying pursuer. What they settle on is building a really big fire behind the walls of Asgard. With the superior mobility of a falcon, Loki drops to safety as soon as he clears the wall. But mm. Gatsy's giant eagle form suffers the curse of all three of Newton's laws, and the momentum plows him headfirst into the flames. Oh. The Aesir all dog pile on while he's distracted by being on fire, and a glorious victory is won the only way the Norse gods know how. Okay. To his heavy metal album cover levels of bloodshed. When the feathers <laughs> finish flying, Ethan is restored to her place among the gods. And thanks to our apples, everybody gets to be young and hot again. So the Aesir can really look and feel their best when they all die horribly in, like, a week? Maybe two if Loki needs a nap after that. Mm -hmm. Can't perish gloriously in an apocalyptic conflagration if you ain't cute. I, my question is, um, did Ethan forgive Loki, right? Or does she keep the apples away from him for a little bit? I just want to know his consequences. And I'm feeling know the subtle difference. Eden apples grant you knowledge of morality and get you kicked out of paradise. Ethan apples grant you eternal youth and only put you at mild risk of kidnapping. It's a great distinction. As per usual, Red did a great job breaking this myth down to the bare bones and letting us know, like, really what we needed to know about this myth, right? I confidently feel like I could go on Jeopardy and say, what is Loki almost destroying everything, right? Maybe that's not the name of the myth, but whatever. I could talk about it pretty confidently. If somebody brought it up at a party, right? I could hold my own in that conversation. And so I really appreciate Red for doing that and all of the effort. And of course, the fantastic illustrations are always so good. Just top notch. I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to leave your reaction requests and recommendations down in the comments below. And other than that, peace out, Hope Biscuits. It's skittin' lit.